I need to show our regular disclosure stuff, which I haven't been showing for a while. So um, future statements uh, are not guarantees. So we'll, uh, we'll go from there. But in our latest outlook, we described the uh, current economic backdrop as one of the most complex and interesting in history. And I think that's really the case. And when it comes to the topic for today is can we stick the landing? I'll try and address this both from a domestic and global perspective, and I'll just cut to the chase from ARS's perspective. I think the uh, soft landing has a much higher probability than a hard landing. Um, certainly in the near term, I think the uh, issues for the U.S. of uh, how much money we've thrown at uh, the pandemic and uh, the war in Russia and also just trying to stimulate the economy, both from monetary and fiscal, has put us in a position that's been, uh, has people all, all out of sorts. And, and it's because of the fact that we've done massive amounts of stimulus against a very challenging economy. Um, and we're trying to kind of sort through the unusual uh, economic distortions that have come both from uh, the actual, how the economy is working and then the policy response to that. But to give you a sense, I, I've never, can't recall in, in my time in the business since 1981, a period where uh, the range of expectations has been as wide as it has been and as we're seeing today. So to give you a sense, um, probably one of the more negative uh, street analysts, uh, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley, who was dead on last year, um, continued his negative views this year. And uh, now after throwing in the towel that uh, the economy has been stronger than he projected, has raised his target from for the S&P from 3,900, from 3,600 to 3,900 for this year and to 4,200 at the end of next year. So not exactly a bullish call uh, from Mike Wilson. Um, Jeremy Grantham, uh, who has been negative for quite some time on the global economy, um, believes that the uh, a market crash is uh, likelihood has been lowered from 85% to 70%. He thinks the jury's still out on the severity of the crash and how much will impact the economy and profit margins. Um, but he attributes the current market bubble to the AI craze, which has create, created many bubbles in the form of a larger bubble. And then uh, you've had JP Morgan, who has been pretty negative overall from their analysts. Um, they still think we're. Uh, uh, about to see uh, a bubble in the stock market due to the level increase concentration in the S&P 500, uh, which is at 60 year highs. And then I'll take you to the other side of the coin. Um, the guy who, one of the guys who's been most right this year is Ed, Ed Yardeni. And Ed's had 4,600 as his price target for the S&P at the end of the year. Um, he's been very accurate with that. He is, uh, has changed his odds of a uh, no landing um, to 85%. So he doesn't think we're going to have a hard landing. We, he thinks we've had a series of rolling recessions that have put us in a position to now not have a landing. And the odds of a hot, hard landing um, are now uh, 15%. So he doesn't see a soft landing. He sees a no, no landing scenario. Um, I think that Ed's been dead on. I think a lot of the other strategists who've been really negative started the year with good reason to be negative. <laughs> if you think about it, we were saying back then that um, the debt ceiling issue was going to really be a problem for the U.S. And that was one of the top issues on people's minds, followed by inflation and geopolitics. Well, the debt ceiling was resolved pretty quickly because of some of the other problems we were facing. Um, so we're in a very unusual spot right now. Yesterday, um, Austin Goolsby, who's the Chicago Fed president. Okay. Stephen, do you mean to be just yes. still? Yes. Okay. I'm getting, getting there. Um, uh, Austin Goolsby sees a golden path towards restoring price stability without a recession, even with additional rate hikes likely. So uh, he thinks we can get to an, uh, a no landing uh, without, even with new, new pricing coming. And then Minnesota Fed President yesterday, Neil Kashkari, said the economy seems to surprise, continues to surprise how resilient it is. The base case scenario seems to be that we will have a slowing economy, but we'll avoid a recession. So it's pretty aggressive how the change in tenor has come. I think there's also an element that there's a little too much enthusiasm in the market today. Mohamed El-Arian had an op-ed where he was describing that 
investors should be bracing for a bumpy six um, couple road ahead. And I think there are probably going to be elements of truth between where Yardeni is, um, where Kashkari is, and, and Austin Goolsby, and where Elarian is. I think we've seen different pockets of problems. And when you get into it, <clears throat> this is a revised forecast, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from the IMF. And you can see from April to now, they've upped their forecast for world growth by two tenths of a percent, um, advanced economies by two tenths, and emer emerging developed by one tenth, but have taken down the emerging economies for uh, 24. And I think their, their numbers tend to be uh, a little ambitious um, overall. Um, and when you get into the projections and you look at the growth of uh, global growth for, for the global economy, flatlining at 3% the next two years, um, but the US dropping from 2.1 to one, I think we, there may be surprises on the upside there because of the stimulus that's been done. I'm a little surprised with the Euro area seeing readings going up. I think there are some problems that are developing there that would have me think that's not gonna be the case. I think the Middle East is an area that is pretty attractive. I am growingly, uh, growing concerned about uh, Africa and what's going on there, particularly with some of the geopolitics that are going on, uh, what you're seeing in Sudan and uh, Niger are problems and uh, the lack of democracy, uh, the shifting in, away from uh, democracy down there uh, should be troubling for the US and other uh, countries, but in particular the US who is trying to get some exposure there and some bases there uh, to provide some stability. I think that's gonna be an issue. I think the big wild card remains China and their reopening as we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. But I think the other issue that's really confusing people is headline inflation's coming down. It's easing, but head, headwinds persist. And I think we dodged a bullet on the inflation, headline inflation because of energy costs. Uh, but as we look to move into the uh, latter half of this year, you have food and energy rising. And I think one of the big challenges here is core inflation has been very stubborn and while it's come down uh, overall from about 6% to 4.7, uh, going to four uh, next year, advanced economies have dropped from five to 3.1, but I think we're about to see the real issues start to come in in the, in the core area. And that's because the wage increases that have been flowing through are coming through at a pretty aggressive rate. Just looking at some of the union contracts in the US that have been renegotiated, you're seeing 18 to 20% increases on day one with further increases coming. And that's going to uh, have an impact on uh, putting more spending in consumers' pockets on one hand, but also lowering profits for the corporations uh, as wage costs, costs go up. And that is gonna keep inflation elevated. Um, and that is one of the factors we have to keep an eye on. Um, but you could see because the wage is going up, um, that's going to create some tightening going on. That'll take some of the pressure off the Fed to raise rates because we see a natural tightening coming as inflation uh, starts to pick up and the Fed is going to have their work cut out for them. Um, the other concern that exists out in the global economy is one that we should be increasingly concerned about is I think, this, I think there are problems coming for the emerging economy and I think the IMF might have this wrong. I think what you're going to see is... Um, the growth rate slow, and this is per capita GDP slowing in those areas. And you can see how it's um, in multi-year periods continued to come down and the gap between advanced and middle income, as well as uh, emerging as, uh, I'm sorry, and low income is coming down. And I think that's gonna be a problem that you're gonna see greater strains in those areas. And it's gonna be uh, reasons for concern. But switching gears, I wanna jump to the case for soft landing. and. Uh, it's been clear that the, um, the opportunities that you see and the rationale is uh, a lot of it's around the consumer being stronger and excess savings are a real issue that's been come because of all the stimulus that's been put into the system. Low housing inventories are a factor in forcing uh, home prices to remain high, which then plays into consumer net worth. And at the same time, you have tight labor markets. So companies are paying up for employ employees and that's gonna get even tighter in certain areas due to policies. But I think the real thing that's confounding people is the timing of when things get bad and when they get better. And this has been the big dilemma. We had so much stimulus put into the system and this chart I've shown you for uh, 
over a year now. And you can see that we added from 20 to 21, almost $35 trillion of bank liquidity, central bank liquidity and fiscal stimulus that was then added to last year. And just look at the US, we added another $3 trillion of stimulus to it. And maybe another three on top of that. I'm not sure if the Inflation Reduction Act is in the uh, $12 uh, trillion dollar number uh, that I'm showing here for the US. You're also going to start to see out of Europe, I think more um, programs or programs developed that will counter the Inflation Reduction Act that the US put out. That'll be more stimulus coming into the system that will tend to prop up the consumers. And then you add to it the Inflation Reduction Act, the National Defense Authorization Act, the Chips and Science Act, and others. And you can see how money's coming in. The other thing I mentioned, and this is the other case for a soft landing, is that net worth remains elevated. And that's fully accurate. You can see from the chart that assets and liabilities or assets continue to move up. The liabilities actually overall have been paid down in the US uh, since the financial crisis. That's why they've stayed flat. And therefore, net worth is on the rise. But I think the divergences in that are going to be part of the problem that we see coming out. I also believe that you've seen a spend down of upwards of half a trillion dollars um, of the excess savings is what has come down already. And I think you can see the excess savings starting to be eroded by inflationary pressures and the like. So the case for soft landing is this, the counter to that we're gonna see in, in a moment. Um, there are other issues that are holding things, keeping things up. Um, so we're gonna have to see that, but there is a case for soft landing. We believe in this case um, has better weight than the others because of the amount of stimulus. And when I go back to this, this is unprecedented. To deal with a couple percentage decline in global GDP, we threw almost 40, uh, 35%, 36% of G global GDP at the problem. And that's staying in the system for years. And now the new stimulus that's coming in could be with us for a decade or more. And that's going to continue to offset some of the headwinds that we're seeing, but there are real headwinds. And the headwinds start with the increase in Fed funds rates, as well as quantitative tightening. Uh, the inverted yield curve, which has a pretty strong record for predicting recessions. Um, and uh, then you have M2 contracting. You have foreign central banks tightening as well, and uh, banks willingness to lend, which actually is a blessing and a curse, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Fed funds, and this is the Fed funds proxy rate that I've shown in the past, which takes into account not only what the effective funds rate is, but the effect of other tightening that's going on in the system, whether it's uh, reduced lending capacity or uh, quantitative tightening. And what this chart says is that the conditions are actually tighter than people think, and it's upwards of over 7% now is what the uh, effective federal funds rate from the San Francisco Fed is. So that says that things are actually not as easy as everyone thinks they are. And that be, and because of the, the speed and severity of the rate increases, we're still adjusting to this. And I think you're seeing, because the amount of stimulus and other things that I just talked about are still bleed, flowing through the system, the counter of higher rates have not really fully been felt yet. And we have had some easing and some uh, supply chain issues that have made it um, better for, for consumers, but you're still seeing pockets of tightness there. The other thing is banks' willingness to lend. And this has always been one of the um, big concerns that people have about the slowdown coming in the economy. The counter to this is that the bank's lack of willingness to lend creates tightening that stops the Fed from having to continue to increase raising rates because lending conditions are having an effect of tightening the system up. And that <clears throat> takes some of the excesses out of the global economy. So we have these puts and calls that are going on on both sides that um, are, are countering the, the trends. I think in the near term, the amount of stimulus that we're still dealing with that's still working through the system is why the case is for a soft landing. I think the other case for a soft landing is we, can, we have felt throughout the, from the pandemic forward, Different parts of the economy at different times have felt like they're in recessions or in some cases, depressions. And if you look at the restaurant industry during the first days of the pandemic, when they're all shut down, that was depression-like uh, scenarios. Now you're seeing the reopening and you're starting to see that kind of reverse itself, but the goods service sector has come down quite a bit. The numbers on 
manufacturing PMIs and service PMIs are coming down still, and that's troubling. But overall, we think the balance uh, tends to skew to a softer landing because of the excessive stimulus in the system. We don't think the central bank tightening has been enough to push it over. But I would say, regardless of what your feelings are on soft or hard landing, we see real opportunities to make money and some you want to stay away from. So for us, it's about as I've talked about, follow the money where the government's telling you they're gonna spend because they're creating opportunities for, for consumers and for businesses. And the incentives they're putting out are really driving capital flows. We're seeing manufacturing come back to the United States for that. It's gonna require a lot of like and other areas. So we think that there are puts and takes going on, but you're gonna to have to be, you always have to be selective, but I think the divergence is are gonna be as wide as we've seen, not only in the US, but around the world, and what countries, companies, and industries you select, and how the consumer plays out all need to be factored in. I've been surprised by two things this year. The, the ability of consumers to deal with the higher interest rates in the near term, and the ability of China, and the way China's reopened has really uh, thrown me off from a how we thought the, the global economy was going to reopen. And I think that's going to have some pretty important shifts for capital flows. I think it eases some of the inflationary pressures around the world because they're slowing growth, but it does put some strains in, in certain areas as does the geopolitics. So I'll leave you with one last thought, and that is the IMF in their uh, update recommended policies to deal with the global situation. And one is they're encouraging and, and imploring central banks to beat inflation and make sure they don't quit the fight too early. Because if they do, they think all the work that's been done over the last decade to deal with the crisis we've had will be eliminated. I think the second thing they're really concerned about is financial stability. And that is when you raise rates as we have, we've seen pockets of problems uh, perk up. And one of the areas we saw in the banking sector, and I don't think the central bank, the Fed or the ECB got enough credit for how well the, um, the two areas worked to stem off what was a banking crisis in developing, and that could have really triggered a, a much bigger problem. And by acting swiftly, I think they did a really good job of helping maintain financial stability, but it's gonna be about more than what the central banks and uh, policymakers can do. It also gets into the geopolitics that we're witnessing today. The other recommendation that they put out is Countries have to re rebuild their financial buffers and get ready for more difficult times because we have had a recession in the last couple of years. It was in the uh, pandemic. We got out of it. It was very short lived, um, but you can see uh, further stresses developing on the horizon. And we have a lot of changes going on. This Japan Central Bank uh, widening the band on currency is one that we're gonna be dealing with for some time. I think there is a funding squeeze going on for uh, low and middle income countries that has to be addressed and that has geopolitical ramifications too. They will go to the areas that are gonna, they view are providing the best support. So geopolitics plays a role in all this. And the supply chain, supply chains have been eased, but the resilience to climate change is not. And that is gonna continue to be an area that weighs on uh, the system, but there are so many positive things going on there that we can counter some of the negatives if we get good policies in place. So we don't see a hard landing. We see the odds are more likely for a soft landing. It'll feel like a hard landing to certain segments of the economy. But if you have a view where capital should flow, um, the areas we've talked about of uh, decarbonization, reglobalization, deglobalization, and remilitarization are where capital is gonna flow and should continue to flow. Um, there is hype in areas like AI that is real, there's real opportunities there, but um, we often get ahead of uh, ourselves when we see new big opportunities. We try and figure out the opportunity scale. And then when you get to the real total addressable market and how fast you can access that, the gap of the size and the timing to access start to be sink in and the reality of how fast we can make these transitions comes to play. I think there are real changes going on in the global economy. I, I believe the title of, the Jackson Hole Conference for Central Banks is uh, changes in the structure of the global economy. We've talked about the changes for over two years at ARS in our, in our outlooks and on these calls. Um, we're a little surprised it's taken the central banks this long to really wake up to what's going on and the need to adjust their policies to a very different 
uh, and very different shape of a global economy with bigger changes coming. So Mark, I'm gonna stop there and we can start the debate. I like that, start the debate. Yes, Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, I finally found the mic. <laughs> um, two questions for you. The I can't, first can't one, believe you, you beat Rob, Rob Colarina. He came on screen to, to ask the first question, but you, <laughs> you beat him. I got you, Rob. Um, in your wrap up, the last thing that you said about um, the central banks needing to look at the, look at, I think what you're talking about, or are you talking about the metrics that they look at in terms of um, how to set policy? Because that, that's something that we have talked about several times in the past. And your response was, they can't do it right now, it's too early, which absolutely agree, but at some point, they are going to have to change these metrics that yeah. they look at to change policy. That's my first question. The second question is, and this is more out of curiosity, the petrodollars out of the Middle East. I mean, they, what impact is that having, if any, on the European economy? economy and our economy. And I'm not talking about the old days of the Japanese buying all these companies. I'm talking about what is the impact on inflation? What is the impact on investments? What have you? Those are my two questions. Thank you. I'll need help from the audience on the second one because I'm not sure. On the first one, I would say the they have to they have to think very differently about the the central banks have to think very differently about the global economy because if you just go back to what's occurred from a technology perspective since 07 and how that's changed the services side of the economy uh, as opposed to the goods producing side, I don't think they're capturing the productivity improvements that are going on because of that. And I think they have to think about that element. I think they also have to factor in the geopolitics are, and the global fragmentation that's going on are changing the way we looked at the way the economy operated. And when you shift from an economy that's focused on most efficient, lowest cost to most secure and um, safe, I think that changes how you have to think about you, the way the economies are structured. And then furthermore, you, you add to it that there's big shifts going on in terms of population and, yeah. and shifts in, the underlying industrial basis of, of economies because of energy and the pandemic and demographics. And, and if we keep thinking about the economy the way it's been for the last 20 years, you'll come up with all the wrong conclusions. And I think the, the structural changes and the transformations that we've talked about, whether it's um, the fiscal and monetary transformation, we've never had central banks with balance sheets of you know, just the ECB and the, and the US alone or at $16 trillion and US up to eight and a half and up from 900 billion pre-crisis. Pre and I think the ECB was somewhere around the same levels. And, and those are major changes. And even though the balance sheets have come down, they're coming down slightly from much elevated levels. So I think you factor in all these issues. And, and as we talked about the last couple of weeks, China is very different than it was today. The war has changed how trade operates in ways that we couldn't have contemplated three years ago. So I think all these factors come in and um, it's the same thing investors do all the time is when the scenario changes, you have to make adjustments to modeling. And I think the, the central banks have to do that for a very different economy than we've seen before. Um, I think the petrodollar issue gets beyond what I can answer right now, but I would just on a high level say, when you factor in the shifts that are going on, not just for petrodollars, but also the climate transition, I think we're gonna be dealing with the fallout from the climate transition for as long as you can see. And it's gonna look very different year by year because of the things we find out about the different initiatives that have been put in place. Um, there's so many different programs going on that are running into different levels of success and different roadblocks that it's becoming uh, uh, more challenging. And I'll, I'll just use the heat pumps in Europe as one of the issues. 
And uh, there was an article in the FT today on uh, how other European nations are complaining about what that does to uh, the whole energy supply system for them. So I think there's a, so many changes going on in so many different levels of the economy that you need to really do a much more detailed rethink, not giving up the old stuff, but focusing on what's really changed and how do you factor that in? Sorry for a long answer on a difficult question. Other Thank you, questions? Stephen. Other questions, comments? Yeah, um, Stephen, uh, when you sort of look at this stuff, um, in fact, on the pre-call, uh, someone was just talking about how cities in Florida are exploding and rents are doubling. And it seems like that's a, a not a unique issue is that um, the cost of, 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 we keep looking at the cost of houses, but turn it around, look at the cost of rents um, continues to rise if anything. And so if you put that together, it's a very big part of everyone's uh, cost of living. Um, and then you tie that together with the, the stubbornness of, of wages uh, not, not coming down. Um, how much are those two things going to be a, a part of this inflationary expectations? Yeah, I'd add to it, you, the wage increases are, are big. And yeah. one of my fears is that a lot of the companies that are being forced to put wage increases through will not be able to maintain the price increases they put through, which will then lead to much lower profits and earnings and flow into their stock prices. So I think that is a real issue on, on a company level. I think that on a macro level, though, it, it's not just wages that are going up, but you know, look at the Social Security increase of, you know what was it, 11% this year with another couple percent next year. That becomes embedded in the system that helps on the on on one side, um, but it actually allows companies to push their stuff up too if they can get price increases through. So there's big puts and takes in that area, and I think this is part of the distortions of the pandemic and the war have created these pockets where you're not really sure still who's going to be able to maintain the price increases to keep their margins and uh, how that plays out, but you could see some real squeezes coming that um, in our view lead to slower growth if it's not done, if, if that persists and you don't get the growth on the other side. On the fortunate side for us, it does put more cash in people's pockets and does allow them to spend more. <clears throat> However, uh, if the cost of everything goes up, which is growing faster and in the near term, it looks like the increases are going faster, but I think in the long term, the persistency of higher prices will weigh on, on that. I think that'll lead to spending uh, the excess savings coming down maybe faster than people think, not immediately, but I think over the next six months, you, we're going to start to hear the stresses of the excess savings not being there the way they've been. And I think that leads to some bigger challenges. Other questions, comments? Andrew Voss. What is that background, Andrew? Oh, I'm in a fancy Starbucks. Okay, but you have a background of a pink. You have a pink. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. Your background. That's not pink from, from my perspective, but um, purple, purplish, violet. No, no, it's like a burlap. Okay. But you're very perceptive. You took a lot of art classes at Denison, I think. <laughs> Yeah, took art history. That was the closest I got. Are you going to ask a question? When you're done with your questions, yes. Um, hello, to everyone. Thanks, Stephen. Any new information on what's going on in the commercial real estate realm? And that this question might be better served for Mitch, who I don't know if he's on the call, but any new information on what they're doing with all this vacant uh, commercial space, vacant malls, vacant stores, how they're converting that? If, if at all not for me i'm not sure how they a lot of them you can't convert to residential is what i'm hearing in manhattan that there's real difficulty converting a lot of those uh, particularly the older buildings into residential because of the infrastructure on them their teardowns they become teardowns is what i understand but um i think anyone on the call would have better knowledge of the real estate market than i do So is anyone on the call have an answer for Adam on that? 
mean for Andrew? Oh, yes, for Andrew. I thought this was a back backhanded softball to his, his friend, but I don't think he did. It really wasn't. It's just everywhere I travel, no. I just see thousands well, think... of square footage in space, millions. Well, we were, uh, talk we were talking about the West Coast. If it's, I was struck, that was one of my takeaways that Seattle and Portland and San Francisco, their urban centers are just devastated. Uh, as opposed to the Southeast. I don't know yeah, what I'm they're doing. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I was talking with uh, with our friend um, up, up in Seattle area. Well, he's actually in NorCal, but he's quite a bit in the real estate business. And he said the idea of converting commercial to residential is um, way, way more difficult than people imagine. Is this Nelson? Yes, Nelson. Yeah. Did you know Nelson? So California did something really big. And he was explaining it to me two weeks ago. And maybe some of you know this better than me. But they ch basically changed wholesale the permitting for projects. Uh, and I don't, I'm not going to do it justice. Can it, does anyone know what I'm talking are you, about? Are you talking about the ADU? Maybe. So the lab wholesale rate. throughout the state, they mandated. Uh, local people yield to allow people to build uh, accessory dwelling units on properties to expand the housing without hindrance. And like he owns, I don't know, 18 acres right by a train station in, uh, outside of in the LA area. And suddenly it just quadrupled in value. And they're gonna, he's gonna be able to build like hundreds of millions. I find that fascinating. That and Cal, that's, California needs to do these kind of things right now. It's been a such a bottleneck <laughs> state. All right, so commercial real estate maybe that's a theme we we all revisit again. We've talked about it. Rob Colorina, you've been extremely patient over there. I don't know where you are. Even some where are you? Hey, it's nice nice to see. You. I hope the connection. Okay, just a quick question. Um, and some of you guys have greater input, but it seems like there's been more with respect to um, the news on um, on sort of a, attacks within uh, Russia vis-a-vis um, you know, -vis Ukraine. Is, is that something that is materially more than that has been in the past? Is this this greater sort of media traction or is there any any developed strategies or thoughts around that? Aside from Prigozhin, who's, who's just in, a, I don't know, Adam, you may want to speak to it. I, I've seen the, the occasional uh, attacks across the border, but uh, these are the first that I've seen into, or have heard about into Moscow. Yeah, I, uh, Rob, I think it's significant um, because for a number of reasons, but the main reason is these attacks are in central Moscow, okay? And Putin's contract with, with the population was, this is a special operation, it's not a war. So they've, seen, they've been watching the war from afar, but now it's hitting the center of the city. So that has a psychological effect um, and it is significant. It may not be the it may not be the hundreds and hundreds of drones that um, Putin is able to send to Kiev, but he's making a point. We can reach out and touch you. I hope that answers your question. You know, by the way, on that point. As Adam, you know from yesterday, we we had a mobilization call. There's going to be a a second annual event uh, in a city near Lviv, actually Warsaw, Lviv. I'll, I'll put on the screen, uh, focusing on you on Ukraine. September 28, 29, 1,500 people were there last. Year. Richard Branson was involved. Uh, a lot of mayors, uh, ministers on both sides, Polish, Ukrainian. Uh, that's uh, Zbigniew uh, Klonowski 
he's been in our community events. So we're going to be teaming with him. Uh, and we're working with the IMF uh, and EBRD, OPIC, a lot of the multilaterals, um, who basically, I, and I was just reminded, by the way, that that Richard uh, uh, Sobel and, and Roberta Brzezinski, basically all those initial funds in 1992, three, four, single single LP was the government so they get get their they could get you know the technical assistance that's I was at Price Waterhouse at the time then Arthur Anderson was young that's how all those practices started with the technical assistance so I think there's going to be not, not, Natalie Jaresko is over at EY now uh, Alexei Kretosov who was the country head for 15 years former Anderson was giving me the insight so I think is you know you've we've talked about the political landscape uh, Rob, you're going to see, I mean, it's already moving. I don't know if the, the Blackstones will move on it, but the governments are definitely going to move in the next, you know, I don't know, and that, maybe not big dollars, but but I think you're going to see some of that coming up. That's why we're, we'll be part of that through the, that, that event. In fact, maybe I'll share my screen and show it to you. Other questions? I had a question for Adam on the uh, Rogosian and what's gone on in both Belarus and Africa. Do you have any comments? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the um, I read a very interesting article the other day about how the peasantry in Tsarist times, and it was true in Soviet times as well, would petition the Tsar or the party head. And I remember my days in, um, I'll get to your question, and this is the way of answering that question. I remember my days in Nishinovgorod in the early 90s when I was working for the mayor in the region. And every Saturday, going to his office, his office was filled with people um, asking for this or asking for that. He would spend all day Saturday with these petitions. And I read this article uh, a couple of days ago that that was actually a way of petitioning to the czar, very much what Pogosian did in terms of um, the boyars that are around him being gonna miss, uh, being Shaigu and the minister, the uh, general there. Um, you see Prigozhin, he was at the Russia-Africa conference. He's intact. He's an important tool for projecting Russian power, particularly in Africa and in the Middle East. So as long as he is useful to, to the Kremlin, he will be amongst us in the living. Um, but when that day, when he's no longer able to deliver that value, he's done. Other, but, uh, by the way, I don't, I don't know if you've received, I, I am writing a weekly called Barbershop Whispers dot 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 Russia. And in that weekly, I did talk about the Prigozhin, the revolt, and the follow-up to the revolt. Um, take a look at it. And it, it will continue. Adam, yeah. throw, throw, it, throw it into the chat. Zachary and then Andy. Oh, yeah, no. So I just posted a, uh, there's a really interesting Wall Street Journal documentary that came out about Progosian and the start of uh, Wagner. Um, I put it in the chat. It's really a pretty good watch, but it seems like, they're going after mineral rights with the African nations and trying right. to establish, I mean, they're doing basically what the Chinese, except they're not building them soccer stadiums. Well, At that, least that's what, that's well, what I got. The oligarchs have been doing that for a while. Oh yeah. But, they, but in this way with Wagner, it's a little bit different because not only do you have the, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, okay. they're basically, they, they're, instead of having to pay for it, they're using their military barter to get free assets. 
Correct. But it's more it's more than that, Mark. They they also have the influence mechanism. Just like the Internet Research Agency in in St. Petersburg, they do deploy these um, information campaigns um, in these countries. For example, they do what's called astroturfing, where you have civil organizations being created. Typically, these civil organizations will be created organically and they will come from the population. Whereas through the Concord group, they, they create these organizations artificially. So they're propping up the governments in these countries and securing those mineral rights. And Adam, you saw, you saw the propaganda at work with uh, the attack on the US embassy where they were carrying Russian flags. Yes, um, that's right. Is- that's right. Just recently. Um, Andy Fish. Yeah. No, I, was just, I, I think everybody's pretty much said it, but just in a, in a two second one, there's 45 ish groups of Wagner in Africa. They, as you said, they've been there. They prop up governments. They, they help dictators control. And it is all about resources and money. And, and yeah, that, that probably has a lot to do with why Prigozhin is still alive. I think everybody's said it in a few yeah, different yeah. ways. But, now, but it's, let, it's let there. Me, let, wait, wait, let, me make, let, yeah. let me make one more comment. Prigozhin is not the only, Wagner Group is not the only private military company in Russia. There are many. Gazprom has their own and Rosneft has their own. But Wagner is the only one that is able to deliver a a number of services, including influence um, operations, where they set up these organizations and they prop up the governments. And catering. And I was going to say and catering. Yes. He, 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 he <laughs> By the way, his catering, his catering, he, he caters, he provides um, meals to the, to the military. Department of okay. Defense. He's got Department of Defense contracts. There you go. Okay. Okay. So Duncan with a question. Uh, yeah, I was just I'm I was unaware of this, but reading some of the recent posts on the Prigozhin's um, army placing themselves in Belarus, there's is there actually a little piece of Russia? that is on, in the Baltic Sea, that's separated by land. Kaliningrad. So there's, so it's like a little island that is on the, yeah, yeah. in the Baltic Sea, but surrounded yeah. by non-Russian. So is yes. there some strategy going on where they're trying to create a land? Oh, um, come on. We'll go a, a land yeah. bridge to that? Is that, an, I mean, this I mean that's a real invasion. It, it seems like that'd be a real, real, you know, invasion of NATO territories to do that. Is that this a, has been around a for a long effort? time. It's been yeah, that's right. Gotten, but it seems like it's gotten press the last week or so with, um, you know, if you look at some of the commentary from the Polish, I think it was the Polish prime minister who is, anyway, I don't know if you guys have read any. I don't know if there's anything new, new there. I think when the war broke out, there was worry that it could have been Used, but I think now that they, you know, they're, they're, they've stumbled so much in Ukraine, they not, they're not going to. Okay. I don't see that as a threat. Yeah, that, that's not a threat. I mean, it was it was one point like a tax free zone and a bunch of other things, but. Yeah, well, it was you know. a corridor. It was a corridor yeah, yeah. that now went even, to Kaliningrad. Just a weird place, uh, Deepak. Well, you know, I just want to get back to Africa because I've. Um, the topic of Africa. I've been in and out of Africa for the last 40 years. I've lived in Benin, which is just south of Niger. And, you know, and we have businesses in Nigeria, which has a massive border with Niger. Mm -hmm. And um, this is actually becoming quite a dangerous situation because yesterday, the West African heads of state, all the democracies, they, you know, they've given Niger a week, they've given this general a week to, you know, restore democracy and bring the president back. And then today, 
uh, Mali and Burkina Faso counterattacked and said, if if any of the West African forces go into Niger, you're declaring war on Niger and Mali as well. So it's it's quite a dicey situation, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But um, that threat has fallen flat. The threat from the the ECOWAS has completely fallen flat. And you know the biggest one to lose in all of this is France. They've had yeah. a huge, huge interest in in Niger for a generation or two, and obviously they get a lot of their uranium from Niger. Um, their interests in Niger are massive, so it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. It's not just about the Russians and the Prigozins of the world. Yeah, yeah, good point. Thanks, Tupac. We, we by the way, we're we're going to do another uh, Africa. Uh, deep dive or series of them will be in touch with you on that. Happy to and uh, you know join that. Michael Daly. Let uh, people know since Adam was driving, I posted a link to his barbershop whispers on Substack if you want to follow his weekly uh, notes. Oh, thank you, Michael. I, I read it this weekend. It was excellent, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, hey, Mark. Yeah. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm to with this. Um, is there is there cause for concern for U.S. women's um, soccer team? You know, we we barely limped yes. into the, the knockout I, stages. I, I, here. I, I woke <laughs> up at I woke up at three, watched the game. Uh, I thought the first ten minutes they they could have played like that for ninety. Um, but they, they're not a team. They haven't played together and they had gaps and, uh, mm. they, and they, they have some really great players on Portugal. I think Portugal is a better team than in the other times they played them, but yeah, um, yeah. they looked like looked off. It was, it was awful. Folks, England, 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 England executives here. And England just kicked China's yeah, ass we today. We, we, we had today. a six, one, Mm. game we had half a dozen goals so england really you know kicked china's ass <laughs> and uh feels good it feels good our next game is against um nigeria so my loyalty is going to be a bit conflicted because um, there, yeah. i like nigeria too well i was hearing uh a podcast about haiti you know and it's such a catastrophe down there right gangs upon gangs you know, in our backyard, you know, do, when does the U.S. or the world have another intervention? But the the women's team, I don't know how they did yesterday or is it today? Um, they were, aren't they, weren't they in your, your group? Um, yes, they, they're at the bottom of the group. So England's uh, on top, Denmark, and then China, and then... Uh, they must have... They didn't do that great. But, they, they, you know, it was it was very nice to see them play. All right. So maybe the, they did well at the first. Did they, maybe I, I, I think they did well on the first game. Yeah, that happens. Zachary, you have another. It might be an England v. U.S. final. Who knows? We have to get through Sweden. Yes, yeah, Okay. But if we do, you know, you know, when when a uh, when Ohio State won it all against Alabama, um, it's because they slipped up. You got you got to. I think it was Virginia Tech at the beginning of the season or whatever. You, you got to have a failure to really succeed. So you got to be scared. I'd rather get scared and get through and have a chip on your shoulder. So we'll, we'll see England when we can after we beat Sweden. Zachary. Yeah. Um, sorry to make a little 90 degree turn here. Um, and hopefully I don't derail the conversation, but does anybody um, know about Apple's pos possible purchase of Disney? Um, any information regarding that? Well, Steve Jobs uh, would uh, get a kick out of that. Yeah, well, it's actually it's actually been a long. It's been rumored forever um, because of uh, them buying Pixar and then him going on the board of yeah. of yeah. Disney. So it's been something that's been talked about. Uh, the question is, you know. Is that an industry you want to be going into right now? 
particularly with uh, how how valuable will the properties be over the long term. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of sloppiness in the uh, in that space because the cost of new uh, new projects and then mm -hmm. also the other issues in Hollywood these days. But would that get would that get approved? That would probably get approved because it's content that's going on to Apple, so it's not necessarily antitrust there. If they gave them if they gave them preferential treatment over everything else, that that might be where it becomes a bigger problem. Hey, hey Steve, Steve and Zachary, just just on that um, that type of deal, Apple's got significant cash. Would they do that all cash, or would they um, um, would they uh, likely use um, external financing? In your sense. Well, how big of a deal is it? I mean, heard about it. what's what's the enterprise value of uh, of Disney? Somewhere less of 175 billion, probably. What was it? Because it's fallen. I don't even know. But they took an 800 million dollar loss this year. I think that's why the the yeah, the yeah it's a good time starting. Yeah. yeah, I just don't see the Disney board. They they they're going to let this happen. With they they might because the, their they property. Overlevered. One of their well, one of their biggest properties is not performing well, which is ESPN, was their one of their highest value properties, and they waited too long, I think, to do something with that would be opinion of one. Well, um, one of our families that you haven't seen around here is James Murdoch, which they sold, you know, over basically to Disney. Mm -hmm. But we have some insight. You know, at, at the other thing too, Disney and Andrew Voss uh, uh, and uh, Bill probably recognize. You had that whole battle this past year, you know, in terms of Central Florida and the real estate there with uh, Governor DeSantis. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, you know, Iger's this is Iger's second time around. Um, but, um, um, you know, I, you know, I think there's I mean, there, there's fits on both sides and, you know, less of the antitrust type of things. But, I, you know, I think, you know, the concept of equipment uh, to content. So um, there will probably be other interested parties, but I think Apple would be best positioned just given the cash and kind of strategic fit. Uh, $162 billion is the answer. Ooh. Maybe that you saw happened. that but Iger brought back- On a relative basis, money. that's nothing to Apple. I don't know if you guys saw yesterday, but Iger brought back the two guys that he had groomed his hair appearance as advisors. That was announced last night. I said he's brought them back into the fold. Not clear their roles, but he's calling them advisors. These were guys that he had groomed to be next yeah. CEO. Hey, is uh, Michael Eisner involved with that company anymore? No. Advisor not that I know. Not that I know of. I was going to say both on the Disney and the ESPN side, the two heads were Denison alums. Mm. George Bodenheimer on the ESPN side. I think Bodenheimer still. Maybe we, can, maybe we can do a management buyout somehow. Somehow, and set the app. <laughs> is the is the I'm assuming the offer is a hostile offer, or is it? I don't think that Apple would do that. I think they would only go with a for that friendly? size. Deal, I think they'd only go friendly. Yeah. Okay. Would be my guess. Well, I want. I wonder if they do this. It must be. Disney must see some walls that they're hitting. Then they, I, I can't see them. Well, the the cost of the cost of producing new content is just going through the roof, and uh, and that's I, killing I, killing these guys. I mean, my daughter got me to to be part of the whatever the Disney monthly. You know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. Seems like it's the marketing budgets. That's what's kind of killing everybody like the indiana jones movie they spent 150 million on marketing and then they're getting out compete by a viral video on tiktok you know but they should be able to make it up if they did the merchandising like look at barbie they're gonna kill it yeah right yeah well and also in the other oh, by the, the way by the way adam adam i you know all my facebook friends from russia they can't talk about anything other than whatever working out and food and they're yeah. they're, having, they're having barbie parties <laughs> they really are mark many 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 of those friends of mine which yours and i's they, they overlap 
a number of them have have um, have opened accounts on Signal and they've changed their names on Signal. So they're using aliases. I, I, I see their real names. I'm on every I, single one. I'm on Telegram. I'm on, I'm on Signal. Okay. Yeah, but so am I. So am I. They're using their names. Some of them have changed their names. Okay. So. Hasn't Disney lost a ton of subscribers for over social issues recently? Yeah. It, That's unfortunate. Mark, could it be, I mean, this is just something that I've been toying around with for a while, but the decentralization of content creation, it, it seems that ever since you've kind of had this democratized content creation via YouTube or other platforms, that the actual big name, you know, media companies are kind of becoming outpaced. And could it be that Disney's strategy is let's just sell to Apple because they own all the screens now or the devices. Yeah. Yeah. They, they own all the hardware. And then you have a double strike in the industry happening, um, which, and then you have this, the AI force, right? Mm. It's a whirlwind, but if you can merchandise, uh, that's why I think we're, we're Mattel, uh, some of these franchises can do really well. Then you have gaming and other things. Mm. But the, the reason I asked that question is, has it had a, a negative impact on putting Disney? Has it had any impact really putting them at a disadvantage to do such a deal with Apple? Must be. I thought they were they were gaining with with that subscription service, but I haven't looked at it very closely. You know, but then Netflix is, it keeps having ups and downs. That's not part of your, uh, or, or I know digitalization is one of your uh, outlook themes, Stephen, but are you, are you in the, and I know, I know. Uh, Nitten, Nitten Nitten, has, Nitten's, involved. Nitten's involved with this through Liberty Companies and Comcast uh, primarily, but um, it's a tough, it's a definitely a tough space. Um, getting tougher. So. Michael, I, I, I don't, I don't, wouldn't expect a Disney deal with Apple anytime soon. Yeah, something's going to get in the way of that. Uh, Michael. So um, with a background working for companies in the content space, um, one of the problems with content subscription services is you have to keep on feeding the beast. Yep. And so it's not as um, ultimately profitable as, for example, releasing a movie to theaters, right? Um, people aren't paying for a specific piece of content. It's all the content that you're offering. Yeah. And then, and then how it's being consumed to your part, to your point. I can't get my kids to go to the movies. Um, even the, well, except for Barbie. But everybody wanted to see Oppenheim. I haven't seen it. Um, I'm curious how Europe, if Fabian, if you're hearing, I'm curious how the, how the Europeans think about media consumption. Uh, yes, I'm. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, uh, I'm here, but I, I'm not sure if I can. If I can. If I can uh, offer a, a, an in-depth uh, viewpoint. Um, I mean, we 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 are, we are pretty much from the from the from the major media production in general, right? So the industry is not that not that uh, significant. For us. I mean, of course, we also see the. The 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 um, the uh, shift towards towards streaming and all, what what that has uh, what that has done to the studios and so on. But I mean, generally, the, the, the Fabian, you're a little you're sounding muffled. Maybe oh, okay. you're, you're... Sorry. Um, there you go. Let me let me give me one second. Yep, much better. And maybe introduce yourself as as well, so people know you're where you're coming from. Yeah. 
So, 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 uh, I mean, generally, generally, the uh, of course, we've also seen the shift to 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 streaming content and so on here, and what that has done to the industry. But uh, I mean, in general, um, there is not that much uh, media production happening here with international significance, right? So, I mean, for me, for me, uh, Europe is a is a follower market for that for that for that industry. Um, I mean, if you if you if you have any any pockets of the industry that you want me to to give a perspective on, uh, let me know. But I mean, generally for me, that's a that's a US US led business uh, similar to big tech, right? But uh, on consumption of media, is it like us across devices? Or are you still going to movie theaters? Yes, but that's not. Um, I would, uh, I would, uh, I, I would say that is that, that that is also 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 in crisis here. But I have not looked looked deeply at the at the numbers. I mean, uh, if you if you want to have a perspective on that, I would be happy to take a look at some local numbers here. Uh, I've not I've not dug, dug into the industry, but uh, but I what I understand is also shifting away from from the from the from the cinemas here. I used to be in the I used to raise I was raising money in, for Russia. You know, the, the Russia had the largest. Uh, Theaters per cap per capita uh, at one point. Of course, it's a, it was a, it was the major propaganda machine, but uh, in any event. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, what I, I love the, the the Europeans. You go to the movies in the, in Holland or Germany. They take a proper uh, 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 like whatever what they call it intermission. Intermission. Thank you. Just so you can you can grab a beer and go back to the theater, which you can't do here. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I th that's not my experience here, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm older than you, so maybe that's changed. Uh... I won't comment on that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's just I I've I've not been uh, I I mean I go to the movies quite a lot, but uh, like I like to watch sneak previews and so on, so I'm I'm quite up to date, and there's there 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 are typically no no intermissions. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, since you're speaking, can you introduce yourself? Because I think I don't think everybody knows who you are. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Fabian Fabian Clausen. I'm based in Munich, uh, Germany. Uh, I'm a I'm a private investor. My my focus is very much on on direct investments. So I like working directly with entrepreneurs and help them uh, scale the business. Uh, businesses. My my. Uh, Across industry, really, um, I like I like digital digital value propositions, uh, software, and so on. I've uh, worked with a with a, in partnership with the company builders, uh, so the, the the entrepreneurs that are building companies in uh, in in greater numbers here here in here in Germany and in some cases in in, in Europe. And uh, always interested to to uh, connect with with interesting investors uh, around the globe. So I'm very happy to be invited by to your events frequently, Mark. Well, and we'll be in the Frankfurt on September 11th from let's be like a lunch from 12 to 4. Yeah. Uh, before people go off to Wiesbaden. Got it. I'll take a note of that. Yeah, I mean everybody's on the call. If you have any questions regarding to to to. Uh, to uh, uh, any questions relating to Germany or Europe, where you need where you need a local perspective. Um, again, I'm not an expert on on cinema in the cinema industry necessarily, but uh, if, sure, if you need a local local contact, uh, just well, reach out to me, uh, and and I'm happy to see what I can do to help. Well, we've been talking about Europe. We talked about that on Wednesday at our lunch. Um, I don't. It wasn't very bullish. Um, to say the least, I mean, you have a lot, you you. I think you're an innovation engine out of Germany, but you you sort of got caught left you know off footed with the energy uh, side, and the inflation is rearing its head. The the right wing party, nationalist parties are, you know, as we just yeah. saw in Italy, rearing their heads. Um, you've been like the voice of reason with uh, Angela Merkel and keeping things calm. Um, you know, we don't have anybody like her in Europe at the moment. Um, but what do you think? What's your zeitgeist of Germany saying to you? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> Germany is a, is, a, is a difficult topic, right? I mean, if you if you if you really want to go back to uh, 
go back to in, in history, mind. I mean, if you look at Germany, uh, when the Second World War started, it was in crisis, but at the same time, it was in, incredibly strong and, and leading leading the world in 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 many regards, right? So, so I I, I still think the the foundation is 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 uh, of Germany is quite strong, but I mean the 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 country has really gone in a very uh, difficult uh, or, or or in a in a, in a down a road that not not that's not necessarily sustainable, right? And uh, that is uh, that is um, coming coming to show now. And and I, I I think Germany was in need of structural reforms for 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 several several years now years now, and that hasn't has has not been done because. Um, things have been going too well, right? Because, because I mean, the the industrial base of Germany uh, was, and I would argue to a, to a certain extent, still is uh, quite quite strong. And uh, if you if if everything is going well, yeah, and and uh, you 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 <laughs> you you get these kind of dividends uh, from from the from the asset base that you have built up over 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 decades, if not centuries, uh, then that can that can lead to to uh, laziness and, and not not doing certain reforms, right? And and those were necessary, were 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 absolutely necessary, and uh, hopefully those will be those will be will be um, addressed now, and and the, the 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 country will will be brought on a new path. But that's that's always that's always um, um, that's that I mean. That's always to be seen in a, in a situation like this, right? Because I mean, in the Germany is now going into a crisis, and it might be a very deep crisis, and uh, uh, the, the country still has still has uh, enormous enormous potential to turn things around, and and I think the the the, the recipe for, for 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 that is 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 actually um, to, to 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 me is written on the wall, wall right? Because I mean, Germany is quite diverse. Um, Germany is actually growing now again. I mean, it was always like the aging population. Now you have like millions of of immigrants here, uh, also from Ukraine and so on. So, so if you if you if you restructure the labor market and so on, I think you could you could have quite in, 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 interesting dynamics here, right? But but I think people will need to feel the pain first, and that is what's happening now. Will that yeah. lead to populist parties taking over or political disruptions? Potentially, right? <laughs> that's the that's the historical risk with with Germany, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me just switch gears a bit. Zachary, you have. Oh, you, yeah. You look just in that regard, are there any benefits to having a right, uh, a, a right wing uh, or populist party take over leadership in Germany for for the next ben benefits for who? for the German economy, industrial. Uh, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I would doubt that. I mean, if you look, if you discuss these kind of things, the question is always, what is your, what is your, what is your reference point, right? And if you, if you, if you, if you talk about these extremely right-wing uh, governments that you've seen in Latin America and so on, I'm not a historicist, so please do your own research on on all of this, right? But I mean, generally, generally, if you, if you, if you, if you walk, if you go into this kind of extreme territories in, in terms of, of of governance, typically that leads towards a Towards a reset, right? Where you where you where you um, uh, reduce workers' rights and so on, right? And 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 double down on the on the elites that your that your that your country has. Um, but it's uh, it, it's 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 certainly not the best way to 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 restructure a country, right? So I I think I think the the anybody with, with a lot of sanity would like to would like to pre prevent that 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 from happening. But uh, I mean, st structural reforms are, are very, very tough to do, right? Because you you need to need to take everybody everybody along, and if if it would be easy, it would would have already been done, right? Similar to what what uh, Obama said about the healthcare reforms in the in the U.S., right? And it's 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 similar in in, in Germany, right? Because you need to restructure the labor market and and, uh, and the labor labor market, everything that goes uh, goes uh, goes along with that. And and there there are lots of entrenched interests that you need to that you need to fight uh, always with these kind of uh, re re reforms, right? And 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 um, uh, it uh, the, the the these kind of populist right wing alternatives always kind of seem to offer an easy way out where you don't need to do that. But the the, the suffering comes from uh, from a from a from a different angle if you if you achieve that, right? Because 
because uh, uh, generally they, they they don't necessarily increase growth, but rather do a reset of the of the of the of the mode of the of the of the of the economy by by um, there you can you can look at look at different scenarios of what is what what what, what is what what is what what is, what is happening, but but uh, in 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 in, gen in generally you just uh, double down on. On, on 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 certain 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 industries, perhaps perhaps military or something like this, um, and and um, kind of try to try try to try to push the economy in a different direction. There, right? I mean, if you want to really go into the extreme and look at, at Nazi Germany, right? I mean, the 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 the, the uh, economy in Germany was was. Was uh, was growing quite nicely, quite nicely under the Nazis, but after that, of course, it would completely broke down, uh, and and uh, was was far beyond, uh, for far below the level before the Nazis, right? So, so the, 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 this kind of can can lot of lead to to short term term effects uh, that are not necessarily uh, sustainable, right? So 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 uh, I in in short to answer the question, I don't think there's a there's an advantage of having a right wing populist uh, economy, uh, 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 right wing um, populist government government anywhere, yeah. um, and and that applies to Germany. That, that also might lead to a more difficult uh, problem for the EU overall in terms of moving forward, when you have the far right who tend to be a little more nationalist oriented, as Fabian was just saying. Hard to see how that works in this, how that works well to move Europe forward in this kind of uh, against the backdrop that we have right now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the in, in the end, I, and, and I was just in a, in a in a conference that was kind of about this topic, right? Like, if if things go go sour, do the systems, uh, will will the systems still continue to perform their their functions, right? And that that is that that is really what the what the what the key key question is, right? Because I mean. The, the 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 free free societies create incredible wealth, right, and and an, ex, an incredible high high standard of living. But that is that is not necessarily always seen by all. And if if, if people um, suffer from a decline even momentarily, they they can get very nervous and uh, kind of tear these kind of systems uh, systems apart, right. So so the, how to manage these the, these transitions is 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 absolutely absolutely key right and and i mean um the, the, the question is kind of what is the what is the what is the danger of 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 a, of a, of a right-wing government right i mean like will you see mass genocide from germany i kind of doubt it because i mean german germany is so incredibly diverse by now i think like like 25 percent of the population has a migration background and so on right uh so so for me for me uh, I don't. I, I. I. don't. I. Don't, I don't believe we will. We will kind of see like a, a trend towards blonde Aryans and so on. It is these these kind of talking points again, right? So it's so it's 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 more it's more a question of kind of the 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 national the national strong nationalist policies and the 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 advantages that 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 people might think they can derive the the de derive from that similar to 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 other countries as well, right? <laughs> For me, for for me, the evidence is that 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 populist governments are not beneficial. At least I have no, I've not seen any any data where 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 those, where those lead to lead to lead to good results. So we we had a great discussion of this. So Zachary, if you really want to know this, come to Germany with us. Um, I'll try. To, and you'll have so Christoph Oldenburg um, was uh, joined us in. in um, and that discussion in Berlin, or sorry, he's from Berlin in the discussion in Frankfurt. He also was visiting us at ARS's offices. I think that was with the blue tape, Stephen. That was like your first day that you opened the That's right. The uh I'll That's put this over. This was sort of we called it I think we had a part two. I'll put it in the chat. But all you have to do is go if you have a subject, go to our, our YouTube page. Um and you'll see here. Let me throw this. In the chat yeah like i just i just searched up europe we had your briefing on european competitiveness oh, uh, nice. we had um i don't know how cannabis deep dive i guess there was your there was cannabis in europe yeah um, just just to clarify i just meant like is there any benefit to having a center right or far right government but 
it I mean I it's probably gonna well, be detrimental well, to economic growth but well, well, I mean, if you're asking center right, I mean, then you're talking just like basic democracy, right? I mean, because in, in every democracy, you're going to have a left, right, and uh, left, uh, left of center and right of center uh, movement. I think, and I think that's extremely healthy to kind of to yeah. balance out these perspectives. And I, I and, and and I mean, I can go into into. I mean, I'm a very very strong believer in in democracy, and 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 I believe both the left wing and the right wing perspective is extremely valuable for 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 a country to 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 function. Function directly, uh, function uh, in the best way possible, and and for all citizens to have their say in the in the matter of how a, how 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 a country should be should be should be governed. Uh, mm -hmm. So so and 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 um, so I mean the, the, this kind of peaceful transfer of power that you see also with the White House and so on, right? I think I think that's a very very beautiful thing for every for every country for every country that that has that, right? But now if you're talking about populism. The question is, what what can you de really derive from that, right? And I mean, if you look at, at Steve Bannon and so on, for example, in the U.S., who's been who's been proponent proposing uh, populism as a recipe, even even traveling across Europe, that uh, that Europe should discover populism. <laughs> we had already discovered it. Thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, um, traveling around and saying that 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 uh, that populist uh, populist policies should be should be adopted. And 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 the question is, what is really the what is really the basis of that, right? The question, uh, I mean, the, the the classical narrative is that you say, okay, the workers, they, they, there's no longer there's there there there's there's no longer policies that are that are that are that are conducted for the for the average worker, but I mean, the the, the classical worker does not really exist in that in that. Uh, in, uh, in, in the way that the worker existed in the 50s, right? Because I mean, the 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 the, the, uh, the uh, economies are are transforming to to uh, service economies, right? And of course, you have an you have an industrial base in the typical developed countries, and and, and that should be that should be maintained. But in the end, it's always it, it, it's 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 uh, it's migrating uh, towards high tech, right? And very very uh, high paid, specialized experts in 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 in, uh, in 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 the in the manufacturing sector and so on. Right, so this kind, this kind of um, person who's the kind of doing blue collar job in the factory, of course, they exist, but kind of to ba to to construct policy for them and the political narrative for them, that 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 for me is a bit is a bit constructed, right? So so uh, it, it, for me, it, it it goes very strongly into 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 uh, emotions and 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 kind of uh, how 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 should how how should, how do you how do you construct a, a, a political narrative, right? And and uh, do do you do you want to walk away from the from the principles of of freedom, or do you need to need, need to go away from the from the principles of 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 of, 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 of freedom? And and how, how how these kind of ideas propagate through a through a through a society, right? Um, and 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 um. Again, I mean, for me, for me, for me, Trump is the is the example, right? I mean, is is, is Trump good for the U.S.? Is Trump bad for the U U U.S.? That's it's it's it, it, it will be exactly the same thing in Germany, right? I mean, I I know people who who who, who I think had potential to to be like a Trump like figure for 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 Germany, right? But uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if, if if I want to discuss if, if Trump was a was a good president or not. Right, but it's 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 exactly it's exactly that that kind of question that would apply to 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 Germany to Germany as well, right? Because I mean, lots of the lots of the lots of the 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 the, the problems uh, that that Germany is facing is not created by by um, kind of evil uh, tax rates or or, or 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 tariffs or whatever, or or, or not being tough on China or, or, or these kind of thoughts, but it's simply because. Germany has an aging population, and people are aging out of the workforce, and and there are fewer and fewer uh, wor workers for each pensioner, right? And 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 how do you keep the system going? That's that's clearly not not sustainable, and and uh, nobody wanted to wanted to wanted wanted to face that, and at, 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 at some point you will have to you will have to face a problem that that the that the whole economic system. Uh, or, or the, the the societal system will will not continue the the, the way it was it was designed. So, hey, Michael, I'm glad I asked you this question because you've got a lot to say about it.